Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia and Pain Management Success Podcast. With APM Success, we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. We work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. Hello, and welcome to episode 215 of Anesthesia and Pain Management Success. We have another friend of the show circling back with us, Larry Keller, who is a one of the foremost physician disability experts in America and somebody with whom I collaborate closely, whose opinion I really respect, and who I'm really excited to welcome to the airwaves here today. Welcome, Larry. Wow, thank you so much. It's good to be back. I can't believe you're on episode 215. Yeah. Already? <laughs> <We> both. <laughs> so I, it's, been a, it's, been a, it's been a while. It's been quite a while, but... You know, good good news. We're going to be talking about not so much the disability insurance 101, but we're going to move into the hot topics in the disability insurance industry today. Like what's changed, kind of what's going on. I'll give you some of my views as to what to look for, or more importantly, you know, how to avoid potential disaster in terms of underwriting disability insurance. And we'll take it from there. Yeah. And dear listener, you thought that there was no such thing as hot topics in long-term disability insurance. Well, you are about about to be proven wrong, so buckle up. Larry, uh, let's start with GSI. Explain what GSI is. And there's been a lot of... Uh, this is a topic that is uh, of interest for people in the industry and a really important one, especially for people who have some health conditions but are still interested in securing long-term coverage. So can you talk about that for us? Yeah, so uh, GSI, you know, we love acronyms in insurance, not just for you guys in medicine, but it stands for Guaranteed Standard Issue. And these are the same individual disability insurance policies that you would buy in the open market, typically from the same insurance companies that you would buy from in the open market. Some of the plan parameters are Preset, so you don't necessarily have full choice of flexibility as you might in the fully underwritten world. And for those of you that are unfamiliar, I use the term fully underwritten to mean, you know, you will answer medical questions on an application. Uh, the underwriter, the person that's reviewing the risk, you know, they will do a prescription drug check. So if you're going to a large pharmacy and not so much a mom and pop shop, and there's not many of these left. Uh, once you fill a prescription, this gets reported to a centralized database and the underwriters have the ability to view your prescription history. Same thing is true in a large number of situations for medical insurance claims. So if you've seen someone or you've had a diagnostic test done, you know, Big Brother is always watching and they will come back and they will ask you questions. You know, what symptoms we're being treated. What is the current status of the symptoms? Uh, a big problem among physicians, you can imagine, is self-prescribing. And self-prescribing for something like an antibiotic is not an issue. But if you're self-prescribing, you know, heavy-duty medications like an SSRI or some type of medication where there's no medical records that could be found. And we just don't know what's going on. Remember, the insurance company is in the risk management business. And part of evaluating the risk is knowing what it is they're getting. If they don't have any third party documentation, or they don't have any third party that's following your medical conditions, they don't know what they're getting, and you are going to be declined. Now, the big thing about guaranteed standard issue plans, and then we'll talk more about them specifically, is one general rule is if you have gone through medical underwriting, and as a result of that, you are declined for coverage, in most cases, you are now ineligible for the GSI plan. So I have not seen it. I'll be the first one to tell you. But there is a, a movie, it's called Network. And this is where the quote I am mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore, comes from. Sitting behind my desk and interacting with physicians, when they call and they tell me that they have been declined for a medically underwritten policy, and then they tell me that they've had underlying medical conditions, 
And I know full well these medical conditions are going to lead to a modification because in some cases with uh, some companies, a modification itself, like an exclusion rider, will lead to ineligibility for a GSI plan or a decline is almost always going to lead to ineligibility. You know, so if someone calls me and they say, hey, you know what? I've got a bicuspid aortic valve. I've got regurgitation. I have other issues associated with this. I know that my first step is, is there a GSI plan available to them at their institution? And guys that are in the industry, and I don't mean guys that are just kind of, okay, you know, I get a physician every once in a while as a client, I'll say I'm in the industry. You know, these are guys that day in and day out are working in the medical marketplace. We are very familiar with the plans that are available, you know, who's got them, because a lot of them are exclusive offerings. And if we can't use them ourselves, we're going to refer that person to that endorsed agent to get the guaranteed standard issue plan. So to me, there's nothing more infuriating than a potential client calling me, looking for advice, telling me that they've been previously declined when this situation could have been avoided entirely. So number one is, I think a lot of people do have skeletons in their closet. And if they're concerned based on a prescription history that might show up, or things that are in their medical records, or they've had surgery and they've had hardware placed, you know, let's say they've had uh, two ACL reconstructions on their left knee. Well, I know that's going to lead to an exclusion rider where the policy will not pay benefits for disease, disorder, treatment, or complications related to the left knee. Now, that's not going to lead to a decline. But Justin, let's say you were an orthopedic surgery resident and you went into orthopedic surgery because of the miracle of the ACL reconstruction. And it got you back to the level of activity that you wanted to be at. And it's unfortunate, but you got there because you had two orthopedic surgeries on your left ACL. Given the choice of buying a policy through a guaranteed standard issue plan where you're not going to have an exclusion rider or buying one where you are going to have an exclusion rider, General risk management is a better policy is one that covers more things with fewer limitations rather than one that covers less things with more limitations, right? Just pretty straight in terms of the concept. So the first thing that you want to do, if BMI might be a problem, you're either very low on the BMI scale or very high on the BMI scale. You know, this could potentially make you ineligible for coverage. This could cause a rating. And you know this, a rating is a fancy term for additional premium to cover a substandard risk. Uh, maybe you participate in hazardous activities like mountain climbing or rock climbing, uh, hang gliding, motorized racing. Well, GSI plans do not ask about build. There's not even a question on the application. GSI plans, if they do ask about participation in hazardous activities, and there's only one of them that does, and that happens to be Guardian, you would disclose that. And Guardian takes no adverse action on this at all. So you'll tell the insurance company about this, but they're not going to do anything about it like they would on a fully underwritten plan. So I would say if you fall under one of those scenarios, potential medical issues, participating in hazardous activities, or you have a BMI issue, the first thing that you want to do is find out if there is a guaranteed standard issue plan at your institution. And if there is, with which insurance company, what are the plan parameters surrounding that? And once you lock that in, now you've got a bird in the hand. At that point, if you want to shop and go look for another insurance company's policy to see if you can do better in terms of pricing, you can do that. But if you apply medically and you are declined or you are given a modification, 
as a general rule, and the modification is more on the guardian side than it is on the other insurance companies, GSI side, as a general rule, you are likely going to become ineligible for this coverage. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And so I think one of the takeaways here uh, is that if you're listening to this and for some reason you're in med school, for example, and your cousin or your brother-in-law or somebody who just got insurance license is like, hey, cuz, why don't you do me a solid and you can be my first commission and let me just write you this tiny little policy, no big deal. If you really have no insurable need at that point because you have no income, you run the risk of getting declined at a time that would be, yeah, you know, it's inconvenient in the moment, but when it really comes to bite you is when you're trying to get underwritten during residency and you're in a residency program with a GSI policy and they're looking back to say, hey, when you were in MS2, that time you applied through your cousin's carrier and they declined you, you now can never get disability insurance ever. So it's important yeah. to link up the timing of the application with the need and try to not get declined before you can potentially access a GSI if possible. Yeah. And some of them will have time limits. Some will say, you know, have you been declined in the last five years? Have you been declined in the last seven years? So the ones that are really players in the GSI market, you know, you've got Emeritus. If you went way back, they used to be known as Union Central. We've got Standard Insurance Company. And now you've got in a very large scale, uh, Berkshire, you know, which is a guardian company. And the way that the insurance companies protect themselves, because you can imagine, you know, I get a lot of clients that say, this sounds too good to be true. How is this available to me? Why would the insurance company want to do this? And it really comes down to, you know, helping the endorsed agent grow their business. It comes down to getting a presence at a specific institution. And then the rest just comes down to what is known in the insurance world as the law of large numbers. And we know we're going to get some business that's less than ideal. And this might be business that would normally require, as we said, an exclusion rider. It might normally require an additional premium or a rating. We might have to reduce the payout and say, well, Justin, we can't give you benefits to the age of 65 or longer We're going to have to limit your benefits to a maximum of two years, five years, or 10 years. And we're still going to exclude any conditions that we might be able to easily identify. And that could be a condition or, you know, like my ACL example, it could be a specific body part. But, you know, would you really want to have that if you don't have to have that take place? The answer is no. So it's really just based on the law of large numbers. And one of the things with GSI plans is the insurance companies are a business. And they say to the endorsed agent, you know, the person that really is running the program at the institution, they expect a certain participation level at different points. So in the beginning, it's a new plan. You know, they want to give you time to get the plan up and running. Ideally, they would like to get a large percentage of the graduating residents or fellows. So, you know, what's a large percentage? It could be, you know, at one point, a couple of years in, 30%, maybe 40%, maybe 50%. So if you're the agent and you're working this program, we know you're going to get people that are perfectly healthy, at least ideally. You're going to get some people that have issues, and the insurance company is willing to make that trade in order to offer the GSI program. The way that they protect themselves is using something that's called a pre existing condition limitation. So, for those that are familiar with, you know, group insurance, you know, like a group long term disability plan, they have this. And Standard Insurance Company and Emeritus both have what's called a 312 pre-ex. And what this says is, well, Justin, if you saw a physician, if you took a prescription medication, if you had a diagnostic test, if you were halfway reasonable in terms of a human being, and you should have seen somebody based on the symptoms you were experiencing, and it was within the 90 days prior to your policy's start date, so that's the three, three months, and you become disabled within the first 12 months of owning the policy, so there's your 12, as a result of a pre-existing condition, we are not going to pay that claim. 
We have protected ourselves in the event you have a almost immediate claim due to that pre-existing condition. After you own the policy for 12 months, even pre-existing conditions are covered. I will give you a very good example. So let's say we have someone, a mutual client, you're doing their financial planning, I'm doing their insurance, and it happens to be that they are a type one diabetic. Now, generally, a type one diabetic is not going to qualify for traditional insurance coverage. They're going to be declined immediately. Generally, Lloyd's of London would be their option, and Lloyd's of London is going to come in and limit their benefits because Lloyd's of London does that anyway. And then they're going to put on a permanent exclusion rider saying, we are cover you for everything except for diabetes or diabetic complications. And again, this is a far-reaching disease. That's tough. You almost hope that you fall down the stairs or you get rear-ended because at that point, it's completely unrelated to type 1 diabetes. So we know you're using insulin. You're going to use insulin right up to the time that you apply for the policy and well beyond the time you apply for the policy. So you're using it and it's within the 90 days prior to your policy's effective date. Six months later, you become disabled as a result of a diabetic complication. That claim is not going to be paid. You own the policy for a year and a half. Now you have a diabetic complication. You can no longer work in your occupation, whether it's providing surgical anesthesia, whether it's doing interventional pain management, maybe it's a combination of the two. You can no longer do any of that. You've met the definition of total disability. Full benefits are going to be payable, even though it was related to a pre-existing condition. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, now Guardian has some unique aspects to their policy on the GSI side. So number one is currently they do not have a pre-existing condition limitation at all. So same person, type one diabetic, they buy their insurance policy. Six months later, they have a disability as a result of a diabetic complication. That claim is payable. A couple of other things that Guardian does that are unique. So if someone was declined or someone was offered a modified policy, and I'm going to use an example. So I happen to have a GSI plan with Guardian at the University of Kentucky. So person calls me up, Larry, I'm an anesthesiology resident at the University of Kentucky. I applied for disability insurance before I started my residency, like in between graduating medical school and starting residency. I applied to another insurance company and I was declined. Can you help me? The general answer, we know this, is no. In the Guardian world, because that decline took place prior to your hire date, in which the GSI plan lives, in this case, University of Kentucky, it didn't happen, and you are still eligible for the GSI plan. The second thing that Guardian does that's pretty unique is same example. You know, you finished your medical school, now you started your residency, you applied for disability insurance with another insurance company, four months into your residency, you were declined. Because knowing of the decline or knowing of the modification took place within the first nine months of your hire date at the University of Kentucky, you are eligible for the GSI plan throughout your entire residency, or if you stayed there, throughout your fellowship. So this is when were you declined, even though you had already applied after you started your residency. And the last one that's unique is Guardian always takes their own modifications or declines. So if you apply to Guardian and you are declined and a GSI plan resides at your institution, even though you were declined, you still qualify for the GSI plan. So very, very you know, unique in terms of that. Now, this will make you laugh because you know I'm a student of the industry as you are of financial planning. 
And I spoke to, you know, one of the actuaries at Guardian because I wasn't familiar with this nine month rule, like when GSIs were first coming into play. And I said, hey, you know, would you mind telling me what the statistical significance of the nine months is? And he laughed. And I said, let me make myself clear. Can you tell me what the statistical significance is of that nine months where someone is still eligible, even though they were modified or declined by another insurance company? And he said, well, there is no statistical significance to that at all. But if you think about it, if the person went to medical school somewhere else and now they're starting their residency, they didn't know that there was a GSI plan available to them at their residency. So we want to give you as the endorsed agent nine months to find them, do your job. We want to give them nine months to find you and the availability of the GSI plan. And this way, you're both potentially rewarded. It's an incentive for them to look and it's incentive for you to go find them. So pretty cool as far as things go. And again, anything can change. But at this point, those are the rules. Greetings, listeners. We interrupt this regularly scheduled broadcast to let you know about an upcoming webinar. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard. On Thursday, October 19th, I'm hosting a webinar for physicians who are transitioning out of clinical practice. So if you're within five years of selling your practice, bringing on an associate on an ownership track, or in other ways, meaningfully monetizing an existing office-based practice and or a surgery center, this webinar is designed for you. I'll be talking about important operational, financial, and tax planning considerations for transitioning practice owners. It's never too soon to start thinking about these things, but this content is designed for physicians within five years of transition. You can register for this webinar at apmsuccess.com slash webinar, or check out the link in this week's show notes. Hope to see you on October 19th. And so these GSI plans, when they're offered by one of the major carriers with true own occupation protection and, uh, you know, financial strength, it sounds like based on what you're describing, and these are becoming, I think, more and more popular, the, the, the recommended course of action, if I'm coming into residency and I don't, you know, I'm relatively healthy, but you don't, you never know, like when your labs are going to show something crazy, get the GSI plan, get the money, the bird in the hand, as you called it. And then if the pricing is like, maybe not the best, I mean, usually it's pretty competitive anyway, but even if it's not the best possible and you're like, I can get a comparable policy, save a few bucks. And when I scale that coverage up as an attending, maybe it amounts to something significant, get the GSI and then shop. And there's really not a lot of downside to doing it in that order. Would you say? Yeah, no downside at all. In fact, it's very common. So the GSI plan maximums between the base benefit and the increase option You know, depending upon where someone is in their training and which institution they might be in, you know, they they cap somewhere between ten thousand a month and fifteen thousand a month. So if you think about it, assuming you had no other coverage at all, to get to ten thousand a month, your income's got to be about two hundred and twenty-five thousand. To get to fifteen thousand a month, your income's got to be around three fifty, three hundred and sixty thousand. Now, a lot of medical specialties like anesthesia, like interventional pain, they're going to earn significantly more than that. So let's say you bought the GSI plan because it was really easy and you just didn't want to go through the intrusive process of applying for disability insurance on a medically underwritten basis. There's nothing that prevents you from buying a GSI plan and coupling it with a fully underwritten policy, even if it has an exclusion rider, you'll still, in a lot of cases, have an increase option. And now between the two, you can get to a much higher level than what the GSI plan can provide alone. Uh, Same thing could be true using the same insurance company. So you might say, okay, you know what, my institution has a guardian GSI plan. I'm going to apply to get up to the maximum between the base benefit and the increase option of the 15,000, and then I'm going to apply for a very small medically underwritten policy with an increase option on that. And now between the two, I can get to not 15,000, I can get to 30,000. Again, you have to earn enough income to warrant it, but that's a very popular strategy. So you're going to see a lot. You're going to see Guardian's got a significant number of these plans now, and more of them seem to be popping up almost daily. 
Uh, Standard Insurance Company has a significant number of them. And the company that's got the most of them at this point happens to be Emeritus. So it's exactly what you said. First and foremost, if I'm not sure about what's in my medical records, I'm guilty of self-prescribing something more than really basic medication. Yes, lock in the GSI plan and then either supplement it or possibly even replace it. But once you have it, you have it. If you don't have it and now you've made yourself ineligible, generally there's no going back. Do you have a sense for how many residency programs nationally, like what percentage have a GSI offering? I would say a percentage, I'm not so sure, but it's a large percentage. I would say there's probably about 125 GSI plans out there at different institutions. So your odds are very, very good of finding one. And if there's an institution where one does not yet exist and you are involved with the GME, you could go to your GME coordinator and you could say, hey, look, you know, a bunch of us do have some issues and we see that GSI plans are available in other institutions. You know, what would it take for you guys to entertain setting up a GSI plan, you know, for us? Because from the institutional standpoint, there is no cost associated with this at all. Cool. One of the reasons, Larry, that I appreciate your perspective is you understand the, the physician-specific questions facing uh, doctors who are yes. trying to secure insurance. And one of the things we're talking about before we hit record here was uh, pain management. And it's funny. I, I was saying, like, it seems like insurance companies, uh, they're a little bit frenetic. They, I wonder, like, do they really know how this works? And pain management in particular is a little bit interesting because you get a lot of pain docs who come up through an anesthesia training uh, there's a couple from neurology and PM&R, and depending on the insurance company, mm-hmm. some insurance companies would look at a physician, as a pain physician, and think, oh, that's like a, a PM&R doctor, and they would see them the same way that just a, like a, a non-subspecialty boarded PM&R physician would be perceived by the insurance company, meaning the underwriting, the pricing could be totally different because they see them essentially as a PM&R doc rather than an anesthesia trained with a pain fellowship double board certified physician. And yes. what this means is that if you're aware of the different carriers and the way that they see the different physicians, one physician of the specialty of pain management may be seen differently by different carriers. And as such, as that physician, it may behoove you to figure out who is going to view you most favorably in your specialty and bind coverage with that carrier. So talk a little bit about what this means and what you see out there for pain docs right now. Yeah, so this is this is kind of big news. You know, so you're right. I mean, generally pain management physicians are not considered to be the greatest risk. You know, they're in the same basket as anesthesiologists or CRNAs. You know, we know claims are high, uh, and we know claims are significantly high in the area of mental or nervous and or substance abuse disorders, right? So when I say mental nervous, I I think like an insurance guy, anxiety, depression, stress, chemical dependency, drug addiction. Most doctors don't think like this. Most doctors are like, oh, mental nervous, that's gotta be like dementia as a result of a stroke, a trauma, a head injury, viral infection, MS, Parkinson's. I've got a physical condition that prevents me from doing my procedures, but now I'm completely depressed because. I went the anesthesiology route to get to pain. I never wanted to be an anesthesiologist. And now I can't do pain. And I don't want to do anesthesia, even if I can. Now I'm disabled. Well, general rule is insurance companies mandate that anesthesiologists, pain management physicians, CRNAs, even anesthesiologist assistants, that their policies have a mandatory two-year limit for those types of claims. Uh, like anxiety, depression, stress, chemical dependency, drug addiction. Now, when I mentioned those bigger areas, even a limited policy is not going to have a limitation for that. Well, Emeritus, you know, one of the well-known insurance companies for own occupation disability insurance, they actually classify pain management physicians in a different category than an anesthesiologist. And as a result of that, not only is their premium significantly lower, but 
if they wanted to and they qualify, they can purchase unlimited coverage for mental and nervous conditions. So what do I mean by that? They buy an emeritus policy. They opt for unlimited mental nervous coverage. They're not on an SSRI. They don't have ADD, ADHD. That would all lead to an exclusion rider on a medically underwritten policy. GSI plan after they're through the pre-existing condition limitation, which we said is a year, they would qualify for two years. But assuming, you know, I'm not seeing anybody, I'm not taking anything, I'm just an interventional pain management guy, I've limited my practice to pain management, that's the key. I'm not doing both anesthesia and pain. If I want, I can have mental nervous coverage up until the age of 65 or longer. And now that disability is treated exactly the same way as any other accident or sickness. So we'll make it simple. A cancer claim or a major depressive disorder claim is exactly the same with benefits payable until the age of 65 or longer. That is a really, really big deal mm -hmm. for a pain management physician. And you couple that with this very favorable 5M is the category. So five is the category. M just denotes a medical occupation. You've got a really low premium relative to the other carriers. Just to put it in perspective, you know, emeritus, the best you can be, you know, is a 6M. A pain management physician is a 5M, one level below. If you look at all the other carriers, a pain management physician is a three, two levels below in terms of pricing. And that is significant in terms of cost difference. So does that mean that emeritus is the policy to buy if you're a pain management physician? It might. You know, probably the biggest downside to it is if you were disabled and your goal was to leave the United States, assuming you were a U.S. citizen or a green card holder and you wanted to live in Belize and never come back, Emeritus's policy does not allow for that. So that might lead you somewhere else. Uh, some of the GSI plans still have gender neutral or unisex rates. This is a big deal, not only for physicians, but a big deal for female physicians. You know, this really saves them somewhere between 50 to 60% off of the normal female rates. So how do you find this? Well, it's going to be an emeritus GSI plan in California, Florida, Montana, North Dakota, New York, South Carolina, South Dakota, or Wyoming. I happen to have the emeritus plan at NYU Medical Center. So if you happen to be a resident or a fellow that's at NYU and you're a female, really good deal out there, you know, waiting for you. This will ultimately change when Emeritus's new product, it's called the Cornerstone, is introduced in these states. And this is going to happen really based on individual state. All the other states have already approved the new policy. Principal came out with a new policy as well. And it's always funny, you know, you hear like these rumors because people don't know what's going on. And you hear people in the home office that I communicate with and they're like, Larry, I'm telling you right now, our rates for the three occupation class. So think of it as the majority of surgeons, ER docs, anesthesiologists, CRNAs, anesthesiologist assistants. All we're hearing is that this is not going to look good. The policy comes out, it's approved in the same states as Emeritus's new policy. So again, with those few exceptions, those eight states, it doesn't look very different. And I'm like, what's going on here? How can it not look so different? They're telling us it's going to be terrible. It really does not look very different. Well, typically, if you were to review a disability insurance illustration or a disability insurance policy for one of your clients that no, they bought it when they were resident or fellow, and now they're moving along in their practice. I would say they're, they're mid to late career. You might say to them, you know, hey, look, when you got your policy, you didn't have a lot of assets. You had a lot of debt. You had a lot of career longevity. You really can't wait 180 days. But now they've kind of aged out. They're in a better situation. So you might say as their financial planner, you know, you might want to reach out to your insurance agent and find out if you extend the waiting period from three months, the number of days you need to be out of work, either totally or partially, 
from three months to six months, let's see how much you might save. Now, normally the savings is insignificant. It's 10%. When principal came out with their new policy, the savings of going from 90 days to 180 days is monstrous. It's somewhere between 25 and 28%. So does this mean I would tell a resident or fellow to run out and buy the 180 day waiting period because it's a great deal? Maybe if they're married to an attending physician, if they're married to someone that has quote unquote, like a real job, if they've got an emergency fund because they were in another occupation prior to going into medicine, but probably not. Probably I would say, you, you know, you need your 90 day waiting period, but just know what is behind door number two mm-hmm. is if 10 years later, you change from 90 days to 180 days. From that point on, you're going to get that 25 to 28% savings. So when you hear the term, and again, this is kind of disability 101, you know, non-cancelable and guaranteed renewable, we can't take it away. We can't change the premium rates. You know, you can get rid of us and we can get rid of you. Well, if you want to take us off the hook and you want to go from 90 to 180, you don't have to answer any medical questions. It's just a form that you sign. It's really more of an administrative task than anything else. Go for it. You know, same thing might be true for the cost of living adjustment rider, which increases your benefit after disability has lasted for a year. Like if you're 25 and you're buying it and now you're disabled and your benefits go to 65, you know, that's a 40 year potential claim. It kicks in after a year. So 39 years of indexing, assuming you became disabled, like immediately, But if you're 55 and the policy pays to 65, you're only talking about nine years of indexing. That might be another move to take to free up some money to go put it elsewhere, right? So financial planning, like insurance, it really all ties together and it's, you know, forever evolving. Um, As we're wrapping up, this is probably going to go live like the middle end of September, Probably getting. I, I'm curious for people who are listening, as it relates to deadlines around academic years and things like that. If people want to qualify for, you know, the residency rates or whatever, the fellowship rates, or they've been attending for three months, like crap, I never got coverage. Is it too late? Can you help us understand, like, what's still on the table, or what should they do if they haven't ever bound any coverage? Yeah. So general rule, I'll just talk about discounts in general. You know, there's some wife's tale that as soon as you graduate, your discounts are over. You got to buy it before June 30th or July 30th, maybe if you're a fellow. That's not true. You know, discounts are available anywhere from 90 days to 180 days after you graduate. So if you say, I didn't really love my program. I'm glad to be out. I'm not doing a fellowship. I'm practicing as an anesthesiologist. Okay, somewhere between 90 and 180 days, even if you never want to see your training program again, you will qualify for their discount. For the GSI plans, it's anywhere from 60 days, which is standard insurance company, or I think they use 62 days, all the way up to 180 days, which is an emeritus guaranteed standard issue plan. Now, if you're hearing this and you're like, okay, I'm already out of that window, and you finish residency, but you're now doing a fellowship, fellowship programs are really treated the same way as residency programs for GSI plans or for discounts. So that might give you availability. I mean, here's one that can potentially work well. So let's say you were a resident at NYU Medical Center. You were a female anesthesiology resident, You heard this, you thought about me, you couldn't dial the phone fast enough, and you've got your policy with unisex rates and a discount, and you finish up, it's it's great, and now you're doing a fellowship at Thomas Jefferson, and the cap on the GSI plan at NYU is $15,000 a month, and it's not enough for you, but you've got medical conditions, and now you go over to Jefferson, and you're doing a fellowship. There is a guardian GSI plan at Jefferson. Just because you have an emeritus GSI plan doesn't mean you can't buy another GSI plan if it's from another company. So sometimes, Justin, it's not like lightning strikes once. This is like getting struck by lightning twice. But here, it's not a bad thing. 
<laughs> so you can take advantage of that. I'm picturing the Oprah meme. You get a GSI and you get a GSI. Yes, you get a GSI. GSI you get a GSI for GSI. everyone. And, well, and here's a really yeah, wacky thing. Believe it or not, in certain institutions, it's rare, but in certain institutions, you might find two different GSI plans with two different companies that are both available to you simultaneously. So wow. what do they say? It's it's not what you know, it's who you know. You know, so I, I look at it as ideally, you know, you don't want to purchase disability insurance and take the purchase of disability insurance lightly. I mean, I will tell you, if you have the world is your oyster and you're going to go out and you're going to do homework, legitimately, it shouldn't be more than listening to a podcast like this or having a conversation with someone like me for about an hour. Then you have your quotes, you reviewed your quotes, and I will tell you, I send quotes most of the time before I ever speak to somebody. So they've got their quotes. I'm not going to give them anything great that they don't know about or haven't really seen before. I'm just going to walk them through the details as to how the policies might differ. Then they're going to say, all right, I saw the quotes. I spoke to this guy or someone like him for 45 minutes to an hour. I'm now going to go back and look at the quotes again. Now I feel pretty comfortable. I know what I like. I know what I don't like. I know what my price point should be. And then it's done. And mm -hmm. I will tell you, I interact with so many residents and fellows, and usually I ask a very innocuous question if they have coverage and they're asking me to review it. And it goes something like, Justin, I know you have a reason for having purchased this policy. Do you mind if I ask what it is? And if you sound like Jackie Gleason on the Honeymooners, like humana, 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 I know you didn't do any homework. And at that point, Either what you have is very good, and I'm going to tell you it's good, or what you have is inferior compared to what you might have, and I'm going to lay it out for you objectively is, here's what I think is good, here's what I think is bad, you could certainly keep it, you could supplement it, or hey, you know what, your policy is less than ideal, you can be in a much better position either from a contractual standpoint, from a price standpoint, maybe both. Maybe we should just replace this all together. Larry, I always appreciate talking to you. I learn something every single time. Thanks for joining us. I love it. I, on I, I strive for that. Thank you so much for having me again. I'm looking forward to it. And who knows, maybe next time I'll be on episode 315. I look forward to it. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to apmsuccess.com where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesia and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I'd also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on APM Success. Friends, this week we have a special disclaimer since we're talking about insurance. Material discussed is meant for general informational purposes only and is not to be construed as tax, legal, or investment advice. Therefore, the information should be relied upon only when coordinated with individual professional advice. Optional riders are available for an additional premium. Some policy benefits and features are not available to all occupations. Berkshire Life Insurance Company of America is a wholly owned stock subsidiary of the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America. This material contains the current opinions of the presenter, but not necessarily those of Guardian or its subsidiaries, and such opinions are subject to change without notice. Lawrence B. Keller is a registered representative and financial advisor of Park Avenue Securities, LLC, PAS, 355 Lexington Avenue, 9th floor, New York, New York, 10017-6603, phone 212-541-8800. Securities products and advisory services are offered through PAS, 1-516-677-6200. Financial representative, the Guardian Life Insurance Companies of America, New York, New York, Guardian. PAS is a wholly owned subsidiary of Guardian. Physician Life Insurance, Physician Financial Services is not an affiliate or subsidiary of PAS or Guardian. AR Insurance License 1057229, California Insurance License 0C37340. PAS is a member FINRA SIPC 2023 1611303, expiring September 2025. Thank you for your time and attention.